All right. We have been talking about deployment, how to deploy Java stuff. And last time we talked about uh, deploying Java as a, uh, boy, the lighting in here is weird. I don't know if some of them are burned out or what. Uh, but anyhow, we talked about deploying uh, a jar for Java. That would be how you could deploy an application, give it to another machine. All the other machine would have to have would be the uh, Java virtual machine then. That would be the only restriction. They would not need the JDK. They would just need the Java virtual machine, which is the Java runtime engine. So they would only need that. But that does put a little bit of a burden on the client, right? So, uh, and then there's the burden of getting the jar to everyone and making sure it's installed properly and so on and so forth. So one of the uh, other approaches that you can take, instead of giving everyone an executable that they install on their machine, would be to give a, uh, have a centralized, have a, a web-based solution. And that would involve web programming to, uh, to uh, use the web sort of as your platform. And with that, you, have, you get into what's called server-side scripting. And I draw this in almost all of my classes, a diagram of a client connecting through the internet to a web server. And the web server normally well, not normally, but with plain old HTML files, the web server only delivers the file. All right? But in websites that are more like applications, you know, Facebook, Gmail, uh, anything like that, there are scripts that are written. These are actually programs. And unlike HTML, they're full-blown programs, if statements, loops, database interactivity, the whole bit. And they take these requests that come in from the client that include things like form data, information about the location, the IP address, other information, and take and create an HTML document from scratch that gets delivered to the client. So the HTML document is created as it's needed, as it's requested, as opposed to having these finished HTML documents out there. <coughs> and you can use Java as a language for these scripts. OK? There's any, there's any number of different other methods that you can use, too. PHP, ASP.NET, using C Sharp. Ruby on Rails, and so on. All right, these are all different ways that you can use to uh, create web pages dynamically. And that's why we can do something like this and when we visit Google. We can go to Google. We can type in Java servlet for, um, let's think of something, for education. And they actually go in and come up with a list specific to your request. It's not like this page was out there waiting, all right? There's code written that goes and assembles the data from the database and takes your request parameters and forms a web page on the fly distinctly for you. All right? And again, it can be written in a bunch of different languages. But one of the ways that you can do it is with Java code. So what we're going to explore today are a couple of options for uh, doing Java server-side web coding using Java. And this involves a couple of things. 
Uh, it involves uh, either JSP pages, <coughs> JSP stands for Java Server Pages, or Java Servlets. <coughs> so that's sort of your two options. The interesting thing is these, these JSP pages sort of get converted to Java servlets when you compile them. So even though there's two different technologies, they behave in a very similar uh, way. Now, in order for this to work, you need a web server that can handle Java. Typically, that is done on using the open source Apache web server. All right. As far as web servers go, there's two main branches. There is the Microsoft world, and then there's everyone else. The Microsoft world has Microsoft IIS. Uh, I don't know what it takes to get IIS to get IIS to deliver uh, Java stuff, because frankly, if I was using Java, uh, if I had intended to cre create JSP and uh, Java servlets, I probably wouldn't use a Microsoft platform. I'd probably use a, a, a Linux or Unix platform. All right, and I would not use IIS, I'd use Apache then. But you probably could do it. Let's Google it real quick. Yeah. Run JSP. on IIS. How does JSP work on IIS? Okay, it still requires you to run Tomcat. All right. So it would be the same way in, I, I've just never configured IAS to use Tomcat. Uh, Tomcat is an add-on to a server that can handle JSP uh, and uh, can handle JSP and Java servlets. And you can do that on Apache and IIS. Apache is typically used even though it's cross-platform, but it's typically used on uh, a Unix or Linux platform. Um, Apache, interestingly enough, is short for, or not short for, but it's sort of a, uh, it's sort of derived from the phrase a patchy web server. In other words, there's many patches that have been applied to it, many fixes to it. All right. So you need a web server. And you need a web server specifically that has Apache installed and configured correctly. We're actually going to run a, uh, we're going to do this through NetBeans. And I would have made this like an assignment, but it's a little tricky to configure NetBeans to make this work. So I'm just going to demonstrate uh, this in class. Uh, I have a couple of examples that we'll look at, one that uses Java servlets and one that uses JSP. All right. Now, the thing to keep in mind about JSP versus Java servlets is JSP is where you have Java inside your HTML page. All right. Java inside your HTML page. And a Java servlet is sort of the opposite. You have HTML code inside a Java class. So I always joke it's like Reese's peanut butter cups. You got chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. All right. JSP is Java code inside of an HTML page. So it looks like an HTML page, but oh, if you look, there's some Java code. The other thing is uh, the, the Java servlet is a Java class. So if you look at it at a glance, 
It looks like a Java class, but if you look inside of it, oh, there's some HTML code. One last thing that most of you probably know, but I do want to make it really clear because sometimes people word things incorrectly even if they understand it. And that is Java is not the same as JavaScript. So what I'm talking about here is not JavaScript. It is Java. It is a Java like we've been learning since day one in this class, just set up in a web environment. All right. So I guess it's different than what we've been doing in this class, but it's still basic Java code. JavaScript was originally created for uh, client-side processing, whereas client-side processing, the idea is that, well, the server can create a web page, but we might want to alter a web page that has already been loaded without reloading a whole new web page. So we can use JavaScript to do that. So things like mouse over effects, where you put your mouse over something and a submenu appears. That is altering an existing page without reloading a whole brand new page. So that is typically done in JavaScript. Something like this. We go to ESPN. I request their home page. The server does its thing, returns HTML. In addition to the HTML that we see, it returns a bunch of HTML that we don't see. internet connection must be slow. So what do I do? I hit refresh. That's not very bright. There we go. That's what I wanted to see, that menu. This page is dynamic. When it gets smaller, it displays it differently. Anyhow, notice when I put my mouse over NFL, I get a submenu to appear. When I put it under NBA, NCAA football, basketball, and so on. When I do this, I have, as part of the initial request, the web server returned a page that has everything on it, including those menus that we haven't seen. And we put our mouse over it and it appears. That's JavaScript. That's client-side JavaScript because it alters an existing web page without reloading the page. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about JSP or Java servlets. We're talking about Java run on the server to create a dynamic page. A dynamic page is one that changes, one that uh, you get different results depending on what you put input in or the time of day you run it or whatever. Now, further complicating the, the matter is there are technologies like Node.js, for example, that allows you to run JavaScript code on the server side. developing server-side and networking applications. So it's a long explanation to say, don't get confused between Java and JavaScript. 
it used to be easy for me to do this because I'd say, well, JavaScript is just used on the client side. But in recent years, JavaScript is also can be run on the server. But Java and JavaScript are two different things. So just keep that in mind. It, 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 like, and the reason I make a, a big deal about this is even if you know the difference, be careful how you say it. Because you don't want, uh, if you're in an interview, for example, uh, you wouldn't want to say, well, I use Java to create a photo, an image gallery on my web page. Well, you probably use JavaScript. And someone interviewing you would, would sort of say, well, you know, they don't really understand it then. Anyhow, we're going to be looking at Java code. And we're going to be looking at server-side Java code. All right? In the form of JSP and Java servlets. So I have two examples, and I, I'll upload these examples, but you can't directly download them and run them on NetBeans here without a couple tweaks. And I'll talk about those tweaks uh, in a second. Uh, this doesn't work in new, with newer versions of Java. So you, you have to do this with Java 8. So what I do in my Akron class is I have Java 8 installed in the lab as well, and they just change the path to point to Java 8 whenever they want to do any work in there. There's a few other things that you have to do for database connectivity and so on. But I'll upload these if you want to take a look at them, but you can't run them here uh, on NetBeans without tweaking the configuration a little bit. And if you're really interested, I could give you a hand with that uh, to show you what you need to do. First example we're going to do is we're going to do an example with JSP. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to run just a page that flips a coin and displays the answer. These should always be the same because we're simply showing the same coin twice. All right. Let's look at the code in this. Coin.jsp uses what's called a bean. All right. What is a Java bean? A Java bean is a Java class that follows certain rules. All right? And the good thing is, the good news is, is the rules that the Java Bean follows are pretty much the rules we've been following all along, with a couple of small tweaks. A Java Bean has to have a no-argument constructor. So there has to be a no-argument constructor. A Java Bean has to have properties that are not public. They're either private or shared. And there has to be set and or get methods for those properties. You can actually create a read-only property that only has a get method. All right? In which case, you can't set it, but you can get it. All right? So. Here is my coin bean. And notice that in this application, there's a place for the web pages, and then there's a place for the actual Java classes. This coin is my bean. I have a no argument constructor that the first thing it does, the only thing it does, is it flips the coin. And it flips the coin simply by, there's a side property that's read-only. Why do I say it's read-only? It's read-only from the perspective of being a bean, because there's a set 
oh, I'm sorry, there's a get but no set. So the flip method goes and takes and comes up with a random number generator, gets the next value, and then returns it. I have defined 0 for heads, 1 for tails. The get side tip simply returns the side, either heads or tails. The get image returns the value of the image. It assumes that it's heads. If it's not heads, if it's tails, it returns the tails JPEG. So this is the bean, all right? I can use the bean within my web page by saying use bean ID equals my coin class equals edu uacron java2 coin. What statement do you think this is like in the kind of java we've been doing so far? We'll be the equivalent of this statement. Any thoughts? That's making a bean called my coin, and the type it is is coin. Any thoughts? This statement is pretty much the same as saying coin, my coin equals new coin. Pretty much the same thing as this use bean. The whole idea of this bean was to make it for easier for people that really didn't know Java real well to be able to use Java classes inside their JSP pages. So this is pretty much the same as this. The thought was is that web people, well, they might not know Java code, but they know tags. They know what tags look like. And if you tell them what needs to be put in the tag, they can make the tag. So that's what this goes in. There are instructions that look like this in the page. Anything within the parenthesis or the, 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 the less than sign, percent, percent less sign is a JavaScript statement. So you can put one or multiple statements between this and this. This tells the web server that you're not in HTML land, that you're in Java land. All right. There's very similar things in ASP.NET. There's very similar things in PHP. All right. All scripting languages, there's something very similar to that, where when you have code embedded in a HTML document, you need to tell the server, hey, this is an HTML code. This is some other kind of code. And in the case of JSP, that means that this is JSP. So this is simply calling the flip method on the MyCoin object. This, by the way, is called a scriptlet not to be confused with a servlet, a scriptlet. So a scriptlet is a little snippet of Java code that exists within a JSP page. Now, this example is, is meant to show the be use of the bean, but also meant to show sort of the alternative of doing the same thing with scriptlets. So that's why there's some redundant stuff. For example, I flip the coin even though when you create the coin object, it automatically flips it for you. All right? And likewise, I display the value of the coin twice. All right? I display it once using this syntax and once using this syntax. That's why, by the way, the coin's always going to show the same thing. 
right? Because I'm pointing to the same coin object and I'm getting the same property, get image. All right? So it's always going to pull the same image. So the other thing you can do with beans is you can get and you can set properties. A get property method calls the method get property name. So if I say I want to get the property and the property is named image, that's the equivalent. Let me, let me do the same thing with this. If I do this, This is the equivalent of me saying my coin dot get. How do I know it's a get? Because it's a get property. What property is it getting? It's getting the image property. So this statement in the bean syntax is the same as calling this method. Because that's the name of the object. This is the name of the property. How do you use a property? Well, you use the get method for it. So get image. So you have to make sure there is a method called get image. And sure enough, there is if we look at the coin. That's why, again, I show that it's the equivalent, because I put that right underneath it. And what I do is I pop right into the middle of an HTML statement, and I say, give me that little snippet of text coming from the Java class. So I'm creating an image tag, src equals images slash, and then I get the rest of the image name from that get image method. And so that fills it in, and that's why it will show it either as a head, heads or tails because it pulls that property from the coin class. Now the idea here is if you create the beans in such a way, creating the HTML document or the JSP page to display them is pretty easy. All right? Because you don't really have to know Java code. I put in this Java code just to demonstrate how you do it, but I could get rid of this. And we really have nothing on this page that looks like Java, even though we are using a Java class. So let's imagine, for example, if we were working on a project uh, as a team. You might have your Java guru who is making all the stuff, all the Java classes and all the Java beans. You might then have your HTML wizard who knows HTML and style sheets and all that. All they have to know is these very simple use bean, set property, and get property. And they can interact with the Java classes that someone else creates. All right. So it's a good example of how you can leverage your team's uh, abilities. Someone that doesn't know Java very well but still knows HTML pretty easy to teach them these few things that they need to do and tell them what it is they need to do and then they can go and they can generate the HTML from it. Questions about this? We have another bean to look at, another, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, another JSP example to look at. And that is what I call index.jsp and we do my classic example, which I do in almost all the courses, where I do the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. First of all, notice I don't have anything after coin. All right, web servers have a list of default files that they look for, and one of them is index.jsp. So when I don't put a file name here, it is going to give me index.jsp. So what is index.jsp? It really is just a plain HTML file <coughs> to play the game high-low. 
And I think I talked, well, we talked about the high-low game in this class, where you roll two dice, you either say you want low, seven, or high, and then you win accordingly. If, if, you're, if the dice roll is two through six for two dice, and you said low, you win. If it's, you said high, and it's eight through 12, you win. If you said seven, and it is seven, you win four to one. All right? So this implements that game. And the first JSP page, it is a JSP page, but there's really no Java code in it. All right, it's just a plain HTML form. I do this because you can take advantage of things like include files and, and other techniques if you are using JSP pages. So if I'm using a server-side technology, I will use it for all the pages, even the static pages, just because there's some advantages to doing that. So this is just a plain HTML page, nothing really to see here. Its action, however, is to call result.jsp. And result.jsp, I have a bean. The ID of the bean is game. The type of bean is game. So it's this class. I set the properties, all right? What that is going to do is it's going to call set methods on the game object. Which set methods will it call? It will call all of them on the query string that match properties within the form. Let me show you what I mean. If I pick low and bet one, I click play, notice what's on the query string. User choice and bet. All right? Now if I look in my bean for game, two of my properties are user choice and bet. So, this is pretty magical here and pretty straightforward. If in my JSP page I say set property on this object game, which property asterisk as like a wild card, what it will do is it will look for every property in that game object that matches something on the query string. So there were two of them. There was user choice and there were bet. And it will then take what's on the query string and put it in that bean. It will set the property on that bean. All right? So I don't have to individually do that. So if I had a student uh, bean that had uh, a name property and an address property, a city, state, and zip property, and so on, if my form fields matched the properties in the bean, all I would have to do is say set property, the name of my bean, property asterisk, and I could set all those properties and it would pull all the values from the query string and set all the properties in the bean. So that's a nice feature that really makes coding with beans very, very, very convenient. It was the whole idea of these beans is to make coding something pretty straightforward that you didn't really have to know a lot of Java to create the JSP pages. Someone had to know Java to create the beans, but the web developer who may not know Java in great detail could still use the beans simply by mastering a handful of commands. All right. I then call the play method. And again, that's not a property. So I can't use get or set method. I can use, though, a play. I can call the play method in this little scriptlet. And then I can ask the property, get the property of the file name for the first dice, the file name for the second dice. And if I look in the game, 
there's a property, there's a get method for get the first dice's file name, get the second dice's file name. Now again, when I say something's a property, it means either as a get or set method. It doesn't actually have to be an instance variable. That's something that is a little, little unusual, but you can call that a property even though there's no instance variable called D1 file name. All right? A Java bean will recognize that as a property because it's a get method, which as we know accepts no argument and returns the proper type. Our dice object then, we can roll, we can get the value of 1 through 6, and then we can return the, va the name of the image, which is simply the letter D followed by the number of the dice followed by dot JPEG. So really, what are the differences in this kind of coding versus converting, coding in the, quote, conventional Java way, like we've been doing? One is the setting up of the bean. Has to be a no argument constructor. You have properties that you can have get and set methods on. All right? And you can refer to those using the bean JSP set property, JSP get property in the JSP page. Other than that, it's a regular old Java class. I could have all kinds of methods in here. We could probably fairly easily make our, if, if it isn't already, make our pizza class a bean because we follow these conventions all along, right? Our properties were private. We had get and set methods for it. The get and set methods follow the proper format, and so on. So we could very easily create a JSP page that connected to our pizza class and would be able to get the price of a pizza. All right? The idea again here is that we make it pretty easy to do basic stuff with a Java class without having to write much Java code just by using these bean commands. Questions about beans. All right, let's look at the let's look at a Java servlet. All right. I'm going to run this one. And this does the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion, or centigrade to Fahrenheit, or something. I forget which. So I type in 11, and it tells me that 11 centigrade is 51.8 Fahrenheit. I type in 0. 0 centigrade is 32 Fahrenheit. 100 centigrade is to 12 Fahrenheit. Negative 40 centigrade is negative 40 Fahrenheit. So okay, this works. Let's see how this is set up. If I look again, the initial web page, this index, is a plain old HTML file. In fact, I don't even make it. A, I didn't even make it a JSP file. All right. The difference is, is the action is the name of the servlet. Now, notice that in all the examples we've seen, which was two. <laughs> Uh, with the JSP, but if you've seen examples in other classes, typically that action is going to be the name of a script. It's going to be the name of a ASPX page, or it's going to be the name of a uh, PHP page. All right? In our case, though, we just have example servlet as the action. 
that servlet is a servlet class. All right. And that class creates a web page, dynamically outputs a web page. Now, if we look at this, one of our configuration files, we have this web XML file. This is what connects the name of the servlet with the class that handles that servlet. So we're calling the servlet example servlet up there, Java servlet example. Oh, no. Example servlet. This XML file says, hey, when they refer to example servlet, they're really talking about this class. So that's what connects the name of the servlet to the Java class that runs it. So if I look at this servlet, what is it? Well, it's a big Java class that has an awful lot of out.println's. And what those out print lns are is actually outputting the HTML. Remember I said that servlets have HTML inside the Java code. Well, here's our HTML that's inside the Java code. So this is outputting all the HTML. But it has other Java code too, because in this case, we grab the query string parameter for centigrade. We then call our convert object and actually go and do our thing and convert it and get the value f. And then we can output the value f as part of the HTML that we're outputting to the client. So we use the request variable to pull the parameters. And we use the out.println to send stuff to the web page that's being created, send stuff to the client. And the stuff that we send to the client can be plain old HTML like this, or it can include stuff that we're pulling from our Java code. Now, this is all wrapped up in a try-catch. I didn't think I did have a try-catch. I missed it when I glanced at it a second ago. But I do have a try-catch. So therefore, if I put garbage in here, instead of completely blowing up, I at least display what's meant to be a user-friendly message. Probably should say something more than danger. But, you know, hey. Okay. So this is another way that you can get your Java application into the hands of the people. Now again, obviously, this has to be part of the plan from the beginning. It's not like you write your Java application and say, well, now I want to make JSP pages in a servlet. That's part of the plan. But centralized versus distributed is always sort of an issue, and there's always advantages and disadvantages with both. And at least here, what we're able to do is uh, I wanted to we built jars, and I want to give you at least a taste of what Java uh, on the server side of a web server looks like. And typically, it's either JSP or Java servlets. You won't have an assignment about this, but there almost certainly will be a question on the final relating to this. I'll have more information about the final when we return after Thanksgiving break. All right, sometime next week. Yes. Uh, it's not all or nothing. It's mix and match, too. All right? Uh, an application that I worked on, uh, there were JSP pages for some things. There were servlets for other things. And then there were the common business classes. So it was just sort of a mix of, of, of everything. Yeah. Other questions? All right. That's all I had. We'll see you up in lab.